Hi, this is Vaughan at westcoatbellpottery.ca. It is a miserable day outside today. It's been raining for two days now um, and nothing is drying out. So I'm having to just do things that take a long time or just lots of pieces. Um, so I have a whole bunch of my uh, stencil card crow mugs on the go there. And then on the bottom is part of an order I got for another shop in uh, Lunenburg. Um, so I got some more mugs there and I just threw a teapot there. I've just thrown a whole bunch of spouts and there's the lids. Um, so I'm actually going to uh, make some teapots, which will take a long to go because it's supposed to rain tomorrow as well. Um, so, you know, working in the studio is weather related a lot of the time. And I just had my winter clay delivered. So I just, I'm pretty wet having just unloaded 60 boxes of clay. But uh, so I'm going to throw some teapots now. Okay, this is a block of clay, um, and I'll get eight of these from 22 pounds. So they're about two and a half pounds, um, I would say, in weight, just maybe a little touch over. Um, and uh, and then I've got some tiny pieces of clay that I just ripped off a ball uh, for the spouts. And then I've got a little block of clay, which is probably a half a pound for the lids. Um, so I'm gonna show you how I throw teapots and then how I assemble them too. So if you're a beginner, you need to bang this into a round ball and you can do this in your hands before you put it on the wheel or you can do it after you bang it down on the wheel as long as your hands are dry. You don't get rid of any creases like that for money. Not yet. A lot of potters just cut all the ball of clay up, a uh, bag of clay, into cubes and then bang each piece to a ball, and that takes a while to do it. So I've always done it just as I get on the wheel. <clears throat> and if it's small enough, I don't need to bang it into a ball anyway, because you can center it with a bit of strength. So once again, this is my setup where my elbow can wedge against the wall behind me, and that'll save you some uh, stress in your shoulders, which as you get older, you'll start to feel. <clears throat> I'm still getting over COVID. It's two weeks since I cleared of it, but I'm still having that little cough thing a bit. But anyway, so this is a Shimpo Whisper, so it shouldn't have any squeaking on it. Otherwise it wouldn't be whispering. But um, so let's wet the clay and then get your elbow, pull the chair over a bit, make sure you're in the right position. And then watch, if I just do that, with my thumb going over the top, because my elbow is banged into the wall, I can close to center it just by doing that. Because my wrist can't be pushed backwards and forwards. It can still wobble this way. So if you pull it back <coughs> enough, you can actually do a lot of the centering just one-handed. And one of my friends broke his arm in high school, who I was doing pottery with, and he was throwing one-handed. So that's how I learned that. Anyway, so to get properly, you've got to push the clay down and then give it a little cone. This kind of evens the clay a little bit. So if you cone it up and then you push it down it's a nice way of making the clay get a little softer almost and then just center it. We'll talk about centering in a different part of this video because I'm going to give you some tips on that. I just posted a video on tips on centering as well. So, <clears throat> okay, so putting a hole in, go for the center point and push down. As soon as it starts to dry out, let go slowly. And then open it up, pushing your hand to the left. Not too far because it's a teapot with a belly and a narrower base. Now that's the bit that I do where I put my finger to the corner of the foot and bring it back to the center and that gets rid of any sort of lack of compression in the bottom area. Because when you open it up this way, it loosens the clay because you're stretching it, but if you go from the other side, you're compressing the clay because it's actually pushing it towards the center. 
<coughs> anybody getting cracks that's often the reason okay so make sure this nice and lubricated and outside pressure without much on the inside at all is just going to narrow the form see I wasn't really doing a pull there I was just narrowing the form timing is important because if your clay dries out under your fingers you're going to slow up the wall so you need to follow the wet bit. So watch what I do. If you've got a wet bit on your clay, as soon as your fingers touch, it dries underneath your fingers. So you've got to kind of time the revolutions and just go up the wall so you stay on the sweet wet spot. I'm barely touching the inside, but the outside fingers are doing all the work. But we have a nice narrow form so I can do a pull now so it doesn't get wider. All right, so fingers in, and this is how I did it in the tutorial I did on beginning throwing. Angle your fingers, the middle fingers, just a bit above the bottom finger, and at 45 degrees, and these fingers on the inside are doing the same type of thing. So I'm kind of putting them in there, and the clay bumps over and over, and the same on the outside fingers. It's wetted again, dries out very quickly. So all the pressure is with the outside fingers, and the inside fingers are higher up, so the outside fingers touch the clay last, and that way it keeps it from getting too wide. And then we don't want the top to be wide, so my thumb at the top is actually pushing the wall in again to keep that top area narrow. And finish the pull right to the rim. I'm going to do two types of teapots. This is the belly form. There we go. Same again. Outside fingers, lots of pressure, dig in deep. You build a little bump above your fingers and then you start to pull. The inside fingers are higher up and the outside fingers are lower down. I'm putting much more pressure with the inside fingers to belly it out. But the outside fingers touch last so it stops it from getting too far out. Pull the fingers up now, so they're kind of level now. The inside fingers are level with the outside fingers, and now we're going to start going in again. Lots of pressure from the outside fingers to keep that top narrow. And the inside fingers are right, you can see with the fingers, they're right opposite there. And I'm building up that little flange area. Wet it. This will be the last pull. So I wet it on, right on the rim so it water dribbled all the way down the inside. So I'm going to belly from the inside and push out, but not right at the bottom. I'm now starting the pressure so we can actually get a bit more width. Okay, I'm not going to do much more than that because it's not going to be, it's fairly soft clay, but I want to dry it out because I've got some more pulling to do with a rib. But I'm going to get all the water off now because the water softens the clay, so the sooner you can get it out of there, the more stiff your clay will stay. I've got a new sponge on the stick and it's so much bigger than the other one because the other one was worn out but it was leaving a lot of texture on the clay. And clean your stick out too because uh, the handle was so covered in dry clay there I could feel it under my hand and that would stick to the clay pot that I'm throwing. So now it's solely wet on the outside so I'm drying my hands a little bit and I'm just going to drag the water off before I do anything to stop it from softening down on the outside. You can bend these ribs, remember, so you can follow the curve of the piece. There's a seagull sitting right opposite me, watching me. They don't care if it's raining. So I've dried it out so it won't actually get much softer now. There's a little bit on the top there. You can always just dry your sponge out drag anything off there keep it nice and even so there's 
no super wet area and no dry area next to it because that would make your tool or your hands slip and then stick. So I have one of these. So I'm going to put that in. Let's wet it first. I don't want to dribble any water in there though. So I want it to be damp but not super wet. And then I put the rib on the outside and I watch where I put the tool of touching the clay on the inside. I watch for that to see where it's actually touching. It's right at the bottom at the moment. There's go, it's starting to push out now. So the rib is there to hold the clay up a little bit so I don't make the pot collapse. But I can get a little bit of extra belly out of this pot by doing that. Make it hang out. And the upper part, I can get with my fingers here anyway. So I'm pulling up the shoulder to raise the height a little bit. Yeah, it's actually going to have to pull up a bit more, I think. Because this clay is quite soft, so there's only so much you can do before the clay will start to sink. So I'm raising the shoulder again, but I'm supporting the belly with the metal rib. And that'll give me a better... That's good. That's a better belly. Now, on rainy days like this, the clay won't dry out, but I am going to try to take that in a little narrower, so it'll fit a nice lid, and then pull up a little bit so I get a, a little edge. I'm trying to get the lid, the hole, the same as all the other teapots I'm going to throw. That way I don't have to remeasure for every one. So let's see, this is what I was aiming for. Perfect. Okay, let's show you from your angle. I need it to be a little loose, but that's a good size, so I've got a little tiny gap. And that's about all I can do with this form because the clay is pretty soft. It will start to sink if I go any further. Now we do a lid. This is about half a pound. Yeah, I need to varnish this back. I'll give it a good clean. <coughs> I can feel the roughness on my little finger. So it's an easy centering thing. Small piece of clay. And then I want to leave it fairly thick at the bottom, so I'll push down and stop pretty quickly and pull out. And then put your finger in the corner so you give yourself that corner mark, put some water in, pull back to the center. Now I leave the thickness there because I'll be throwing a little knob on these later on, or I'll make a bird, whichever. But then leave some clay under there. Just be finger there and push against your finger on the inside and it'll dry very quick so you have to get release and get some water in there. And when you've got your fingers, you can push them together to make a little lip. Get it wet again. And do the same again. Push in and then you'll get a bit taller. The taller the lip, the less likely the lid will fall out of the pot too. And you can even put a little knob of clay on your lip to actually catch under the teapot edge that will stop the lid from falling out. I used to do that, but I now just always figured, well, that will probably get knocked off in the wash somewhere. So, so I stopped doing it because people don't know that that's sticking out in a washing bowl and it might get knocked off. But anyway, there's your lip. I just push this rib underneath there to push in hard so it makes it hang out more. <clears throat> and now I'm going to push that back to where it was. And I'm going to measure it to see if I've got the right size. It is so close, but it did touch. 
And I know I've got a little bit of wiggle room because I made the teapot a bit bigger, but I'm just going to push in a little more. Okay, so that one now, if I measure it, should be spot on. There we go, perfect. And you can cut it off with water, uh, or on things that are pretty thick like this, you can just cut through like that. And then just, as long as you've got clean hands, you can just lift it, and it'll come off just like that anyway. You don't need to slide with the water, because this is pretty thick, so. Tiny piece of clay, <clears throat> which is probably harder to center because it is so small. My fingers are so big on a small piece of clay like this, it's quite hard. But it's quite difficult to throw a spout. But you still have to do basically the same principles. You push right the way down. It's drying, so I've got to get some water on the end of my finger there until you touch the bat, the actual bat. And then you open it up a touch. And then one finger is all you need to. And there's a thing about spouts twisting because of how long you, if you overthrow them a little bit. So you've got to try not to overthrow this piece of clay because the spout can twist in the firing and it will turn in a direction. I'm not sure what the science of that is. I think it's that you're pulling the clay so much in want because the wheel spins that it, it tries to re return to its original shape a little bit, the molecules. But anyway, this is all you have to do for a spout. Just make a little teapot, not a teapot, a, a, a handle for a saucepan type of thing. It's quite thick at the bottom there, so I opened it up a little bit with my inner finger then. And as soon as you've got the wall so it's fairly thin, then you wet it again. And then you have to take it in with pinching your fingers and thumb together. So you're basically collaring it. And that will make it get a bit taller. You don't have to have a tall spout, you can have a tiny stubby little spout on a teapot. But that's about it, that's all you have to do. Now there is water inside there, but I can't get it out because it's so narrow. But what the way I take them off the wheel is I give myself a little edge with the rib there. Just make sure you don't leave too much water on there so you get that off. And then I take my needle and I just cut right at the bat, all the way around as it rotates. Eventually it releases like that, and you can slide it to the end of the bat if you want to, but you can just lift it with a needle sometimes. But then you've got a nice little spout. It really makes it easy if you have that elbow locked into a wall. Because then you just have to push with the heel of your hand and then your wrist can't be pushed back. It's definitely locked in, as you can see. It's The wrist is actually bent back a little bit so that I'm locked in there. Don't let it get dry, otherwise it might push your hand past that. You might hurt your hand. But wet, slippery clay just keeps sliding through your hand. So then, you got it, I've got it centered anyway, but it's a good idea when you're a beginner just to loosen the clay a little bit. And stiff clay that comes out of a box is always a little harder than if you work it a little bit, which is why a lot of people wedge their clay first to loosen the clay up a little bit. But by moving the clay up and then flatten it down again, you actually are sort of wheel wedging almost. Okay, I want a wider base. So I'm going to take this down wider. And then put your hole in. It's hitting my wrist with a, something on the bat itself. I think you can hear that tapping noise. 
So I'm simply opening up with my fingers at a certain height so I don't get deeper to get a nice flat wide base. You can make it as wide as you want. And then I run my finger from the outer corner again, right at the corner, close to you there. And I pull it back to the center to make a little bubble in the center and then I push it down. I don't take that bubble out. And then we work on this side of the clay. I'm lifting the bat a little bit off the pin there. You can hear it knocking. And see, outer pressure keeps it narrow. Do the same type of thing again. Pressure. Fingertips push together. Build, build a little lump above your fingers and then you chase that lump in the wet clay all the way to the top. One of the dangers of doing a pull like that is if you bring with your fingers in position like that you can bring your thumb and make it touch the clay and it dries the clay before your fingers get to it so make sure when you're doing that my think my thumb is holding my finger but it's not touching the clay up there let's lift you up a bit water right down on the rim so it goes inside and out now i'm going to put my hand in and I'm going to push out on the inside hand and let my outside fingers just glide a little bit on the point where my fingers are pressing on the inside so I can belly it. And now I don't want it too wide this area so I'm going to let go a bit on the inside. Pressure with the outside fingers just to see how much height I can get back. Because when you belly it, it reduces the height a little bit. So now I'm almost doing a pull to thin the wall and make it taller. And it's way too wide at the moment. But I'm going to get the water out. And I will do some narrowing next. Remember the clay gets soft the longer you keep the water in there. And you can get the water off just by dragging the metal rib down like that. So that will make sure that belly doesn't get any softer. And I'm going to just use two fingers or maybe four fingers. You can use six if you can get them on there. And just do that and you can narrow it. I want to make sure I get to that point where the lids are going to fit. Perfect. We don't need to do much more. You can do this after, but after many years of throwing, you can eyeball things uh, and be pretty accurate. I know that's terrible for anybody beginning to hear, but because you've got to put in all those years, but I don't measure that much anymore. I, I just get, I have a feel for it. And that's why practice, practice, practice is important. And then we, put a foot on the bottom. These ones barely get trimmed. Turn the rib around and then you've got your double foot. Yeah, I had clay delivered this afternoon in all that rain, so I got nice and wet. But that's 60 boxes of clay for the winter. All right, so that's a, the, op the other shape of teapot that I make, actually. And this one is much more stable. I think I widened it a touch, so I'm just going to push in a touch there. And do that measurement again. Got just a little bit of a gap, so that means the lid will fit, but I'm just going to push it in a touch. I leave the rim a little thicker, so I can always trim a little out when I'm trimming as well. Got that nice little edge for the spout to come off because I'll put the spout top around there coming up and then you've got the foot 
where the handle will slide in at the foot as well. And dry your wheel. Don't take the pot off with a wet wheel all around it. You're gonna leave it on the bat anyway, but your pieces will dry out faster if you get rid of the water that's around them. Okay, this is the next day, and I've had these stored overnight in a damp cupboard, um, so they stiffened up a little bit, but they're still very soft, because I throw water in the damp cupboard, that's why it's called a damp cupboard. Um, so if it is a nice form, but I feel like, well, I could get a little bit better out of this, I put it back on the wheel, and I use my throwing stick, because the, the top is now too narrow to get my hand inside, without really denting the top, and I just use the throwing stick, and I place it, and then look for, for the profile, when I see it's touching, I start pushing out and just watch it carefully because I can't go too far, otherwise it will um, get too thin. But make sure you don't hit the rim as well. You can see the tool, it's widening it just a little bit. And now it's starting to catch a little bit too. You can try and steady the tool a little bit, but there you go, it's better. You can improve the form of your piece as long as you don't sacrifice strength by thinning it too much. Now, if there's any difference in one side to the other for dryness, you will get an off-site, off-center piece at this point. So you can't do it. So when you put them in the damp cupboard, you've got to try not to have it, depending on the you know, physical nature of your damp cupboard, so that it actually gets dry on one side and not the other. And if you're careful, I didn't want to do this at first, but you can use your metal tool again and put the tool right opposite the metal tool that will actually sort of steady it a little bit, but that kind of block you seeing, so. but I can make sure that we don't get a, that's a much nicer form. I hope you agree, but um, I'll just get rid of anything that kind of is a bit irregular. There's a little flat area just there. We're talking about little tiny fractions of a centimeter or inch that I'm changing here just to get a nicer form. And then I did catch the rim a couple of times while I was doing that, so I'm just going to smooth it with the sponge again. But I didn't change the size. But that's worth doing um, as long as you don't thin the wall too much. Because I, I think this form will be so much nicer now. The teapots are now firm enough, and yet they're still very easily to move. All right, so so it's once again, it's like when I put handles on mugs, I test it so I can actually rub it and pull some off on my end of my finger there, so it's actually sticky enough to stick to your finger, and that way I know I don't have to do any scoring or any scratching to actually take off the uh, to add on to the the, the pieces, um, and I have. Wherever I stick my spouts, I'm gonna to have to put some little holes because I always do this tea strainer kind of holes in my teapots. Um, and you don't need to do that because you know teas and tea bags most of the time, but I like to do it just in case somebody wants to use real tea. <clears throat> but um, so I'm just using my trimming tool again. It's just for a little hole, a little loop tool, and I simply use it like a drill. And then pull out a little piece of clay and I know what I'm doing as far as height for my spout so um, so you might want to put your spout on as a test before you put your holes in if you're not sure where they have to go but I've, through experience I always put my spout at this height I can talk about that in a minute but um, so I'm gonna put Six nice big holes, maybe even seven. But uh, because the clay is so 
soft, it's not right, you can't really use one of those special tools you use to put the holes in. So I just use that loop tool, it's, it doesn't block up with glaze, so it's quite an easy one to do. Now I can put one just there, but I don't think I'll need one up that high. <clears throat> but if I wanted to, I could put two more down there. So you can decide how many you need in a sense. That, um, and then where you put them on the inside, you just gotta rub with a paintbrush against where you put the holes to get rid of any burrs and then take a look again to see if you actually blocked any holes up which you don't usually block any up. Same here if you want but this is going to be covered up by the spout anyway. But I'm just rounding off those holes a little bit. So the more holes you have the more the tea will flow and you and glaze will fill some of them up a little bit. So let's have a look at the spout. <coughs> should cut through these first so I can lift them off. Some of them will probably come off. But yeah, they're coming off quite easy actually. So the spout is usually very thick um, and you don't need it that thick. But you can see just by putting it on, it's gonna need some playing around to actually make it fit on there. So I simply take my little thin little cutting tool. This one's used with texture and clay, but I like to use it for cutting as well. And then you can take a look again. Just a little bit of playing, I think, now. <clears throat> so I look at it and I kind of tell that, you know, I want it to be a little bit um, stick out at the top and the bottom of it, so I'm going to take a little bit off the inside on the sides. So I think then it will fit a little better, and that's much better. Now, here's the, um, the thing that you need to know about spouts. Um, and um, there's a, a really good video on teapots I know on the internet already about what I'm about to say, but um, the top of the teapot, this shouldn't be any higher than the top of the teapot here, because if you do make this too high up, the tea will flow over the lid area here before it flows out of here. And so you really got to make sure when you put this on that you get it that area below the height there, all right? Um, and that way it will um, flow out of the spout before it flows over the top here. Um, and just take a look at your angle, make sure you've got a good angle. And then I usually just move it like that and it will make a mark. And these spouts are really soft. I mean, they're very sticky, very soft. It's a bit textural so you can just put a little water there if you want to, but you don't need to because this clay is really soft. To have a little bit of lubrication, a little moisture, just to really make that surface very sticky. Because I'm not going to be doing any scoring here, I just want to make it so there's a good amount of slip built up from the actual clay itself where I'm going to stick this and make sure once again that you keep these holes open. So you can, before you stick the spout on, it's a good idea just to open them up a bit more. The clay is so soft they're easy to block up. And then you take your spout and you take a look, make sure it's going to be level, rotate it, because it's quite easy to move this. You know, I used to stand up for this, but just attach it by a little bit of pressure. So we know it's not going to move again. And then take a modeling tool, and in my case I just use my paintbrush because I like to use the ferrule of the brush as a modeling tool. And that way I can now start pushing that clay in. The metal is a really nice tool for modeling. And I'm pushing my finger underneath to press back where the tool is pressing. But you see, I haven't had to score or scratch. It saves a lot of time by not doing that. 
but I'm, it's all about timing with the clay itself. The clay should be so sticky that the clay is just going to stick. And if I have trouble getting my hand in, which I just couldn't reach quite low down to that point there, I get a paintbrush that's quite wide, and you can use a throwing stick if you want, and I stick it right behind where I'm pressing. Just pressing right behind there to get that to stick. And then I'll take another the wide paintbrush and start smoothing a little bit. You can once this firms up a little bit, you can go over it again as well. It's gorgeous outside today as well. The sun is out, it's about 17 degrees. The spout is still soft at the end there as well. Um, I'm just looking at it to make sure I've got no odd looking you know, angles. And proportionally, I threw an extra spout just in case one of them wasn't the right shape or not. But, and then I take a knife um, do I have a knife here? Yes, I do. <clears throat> now, you don't have to do this, but I like to cut out. It looks like a saucepan handle at the moment. I've always thought that. So I just take out a little nick at the top. And I don't always do this. Some people ask me not to do this. They say it looks like it's broken. But I just feel like it looks on purpose. And it, it just kind of makes you look like you've done something to that little spout to stop it look like you know, a you know, handle that you grab. And then the bottom, you want your teapot to actually not dribble, which is almost impossible, but we're using it lubricated. I roll the paintbrush backwards and forwards to the end and just curl it over a little bit. So that there's a, not a totally sharp edge there, but it rolls down so that if there is a drip, it falls off instead of dribbling down the teapot. And it should fall off then into the cup that you're pouring into. Need to go down a little bit further there. You, you know, it, it, it's not crucial you do this, but yeah, I feel more confident telling my customers that the teapot doesn't drip, except for maybe one, which, which should just drip into the cup anyway. So it just goes down just a touch. So let's tilt you down a bit so you can see what I'm about to do. I've got a little piece of clay rolled out, just a little coil here. And I, you've seen me do this in earlier videos where I texture this little loop. Like that. It's basically very textural. We'll have a nice, glaze pick up and then bend it over make sure you do this with the clay is very soft otherwise these little marks you made will actually be like scoring the clay and make it crack and um, and then wet the end Let's see if I can lift it up it's hard to hold I need fatter fingers do it like that So you've fattened it up just a little bit. And then, very carefully, without bending or cracking it too much, I will stick it right where the, the, the actual teapot spout joins onto the pot, and I will stick it right there. Don't want to get it too close to the, the actual, um, where the lid is, because the lid might stick out far enough. And because I wet it, and we, we know this is totally soft in that area, that will stick really easily. And then just work it with that nice little paintbrush. One that's, you know, this paintbrush is not a watercolor paintbrush. It's actually 
a little stiffer. I think they may, it's meant for painting acrylic. But it's not a hog hair brush. And that's why I like this brush, because it's firm and yet it's got a softness so it doesn't leave brush strokes much. It's a nylon paint brush. And this gives you the ability to loop your finger in when you're actually pouring tea, you're holding the handle, you can loop it in there without putting your hand under the spout, um, which would actually, you know, could get hot. And then just kind of make sure this is just the right angle. And this has to be protected while drying uh, because those cracks, which will catch texture, tend, like I said, it's like scoring paper, it'll tear easier for paper and for this, it will crack easier in that. So I will often put a little piece of cling film, saran wrap, just over this thing while it's drying, uh, just to make sure it dries slower and all that, and, um, and that protects it. And the next thing they have to do uh, is put a handle on. So I've pulled some regular handles, which I've shown in many videos how I pull handles. Um, and because of the angle of this, I'm going to squish this down really hard. So really thicken up the end of the handle a lot there, but I have it sort of further out at the top because of the angle of that, so I can copy that sort of angle of the belly. So it will sit flush on the top like that. Um, <clears throat> this is still, this is actually about 3.30 in the day. Yep, it's still sort of sticky, but I, I feel like I do need to add a little bit more water on this part here. But it's great because it's stiffened up enough so I can't dent it very easily at this point, this time. So making sure I get a nice slippy area right there. And then just a little bit on the end there. You don't really need much on that part because these handles are very soft. And then you've got to try to get this lined up with the spout. It's going to be hard for me to do it that way because I can't see much, but I'll try. So I'm just simply looking and to try to line it up with the spout so we don't have a funny angle. And then basically just move it around a little bit, side to side, up and down, side to side, up and down. And before it's totally joined, take another look to make sure you're lined up. Yep, that's pretty good actually. Um, you could always readjust it if it was a bit off at that point, but now once you really press it in, it's going to be like you'd have to cut it off to actually get it better. And then just kind of pull it a bit and let the handle hang, and then you can just sort of take it in, knowing that it's going to be fairly straight. And just judge that you can get a good four handle, four finger grip underneath that at least. Yep, that's pretty good. And then it's so sticky down here, you don't need any water down there. And I just leave enough in my handles to f turn it over like that and give my handle a little extra thickness at the bottom. And there you go, you can see it's lined up. That's the little saran wrap over that handle I put up there too. Uh, and just kind of make sure it's fairly straight because now we're really going to join it in there. The bottom, I can't get my hand in there. So I hold the paintbrush like that, a really thick, wide paintbrush down there, and I position it right opposite where I'm going to put the pressure on the handle at the bottom and run with some water on my thumb backwards and forwards to actually really get that pressure in there. And then you can move side, sideways to kind of join it in there and then use your finger on this side to join that handle up. And the same on the bottom, just kind of smudge it. And then I've been piling up my slip soft clay that I've been cutting off the spouts as I join them underneath. So I've got some really sort of gummy clay here, which I make into a little wedge. And I stick it in there and then use a paintbrush to force it down into that gap. A little thinner paintbrush would do the better job there. So I'm, I'm really making that area at the bottom thick. Whenever you put handles on a piece, it's vulnerable to getting knocked off, remember? So you want to make sure that it's really got a lot of thickness where that handle is. 
It gives the customer more confidence if it's thick enough. And then you need a little support because this clay is very soft. So I make a little lump of clay, stick it down on the bottom there. And then when I start positioning this properly, I can put this underneath there to hold that handle up for a good angle. And now we're going to work it right in. And we can still move her a little bit with the clay if it was a bit off, but we'll have to wait and see how we, what we do. Then I put my finger up and pull up on the handle so I can pull in some clay from the underside of the handle there to really get that totally joined underneath. Same on this side. And then down here too. Just getting concentrating on really filling in the join area, making sure it's well joined. And then we can do some smudging on the outside of the handle to make sure that's in. And then it's about what you like to please your, you know, the aesthetics of the piece, basically. You can add a little clay if you felt like it was a bit thinned in that area, which I don't think I can, I uh, need to do there. But if I wanted to, I could add a little bit of clay onto the handle just to thicken it up a bit more. And you're really trying to get the angle down there good. So it looks like it's flowing into the bottom of the teapot there. So paintbrushes are really nice, to, but you don't want to overwet the handle either. Disc, like a ball of clay that I make into a disc, which I then stick right on the top of the handle. And some potters just make a thumbprint in here just to thicken it. So you could do that or you could do a stamp in there as well. But it thickens up that. I use that little spiral. And that puts enough pressure on that to make sure it's really stuck in there. And then you have to work that a bit more. But it thickened up the look, the appearance of that handle on the top a little bit then. And as it dries, you can modify the curve of the handle. Because it sags so easily at this point. You're, you're just trying to make sure it satisfies that kind of pleasing shape. Depot. But, um, and now it's down to the lid. Oh, let's see, is it straight? Yeah, you can see that's pretty straight. Okay, now I've got to deal with the lids. I've had these drying the right way up uh, for most of the day. It's been pretty humid today. And this is my collar that I use for lids. Uh, it's just thrown cylinder basically that I can sit my lid on top of so I don't risk denting the rim of the actual piece underneath. Um, you know, the, it actually, if you grip with the giffing grip anyway or lumps of clay, you might dent that. So all I've got to do, um, I'm not, it's a little off. I'm not even going to bother correcting that. It's a little, oh, now I just pulled it. So, but you can just move it around on a collar, which is nice. You see how sticky it is? Because this is not trimmable normally. Because I still got to attach the, the actual handle. So I'm trying to trim without it, allowing the trimming to get back on there because it will just re-stick. But these have been, I would have liked it to have been a little bit firmer. And I can just, there's a little bit of clay that I can just literally just push it back in. But I'm just going to trim down a bit. It's sticky enough so if, it, if I'm lucky it won't actually move on top of that collar. I've got a lot of collars, I've shown them in the past. They're all above my wheel here for different things that I do. So when you're doing something, if a collar would make it uh, easier, it's better to just take a few minutes and throw yourself a collar so next time you make that piece you've already got it made. Some people just throw a collar when they're making the pottery and it's not even fired, but I decided to fire all mine. 
Okay, so we got that. It's nice and smooth. It is going to be trimmable after this if I want to, but all I do is just wet that top area just there because it's very soft. And then I threw some little knobs. So if anybody ever wants to make their own kitchen cabinet knobs, it's not that hard to do. Maybe I should throw that, show that in another video, but literally I just made a, centered a big lump of clay and on the top of each one I just squeezed underneath the actual top part and it made a knob instantly. So these are easy enough to do. And then just give myself a little sort of stickiness with that. I want it to be sticky but not slippery. And then you place it in the center there and move it around until it feels like it's stuck, which it is now. Make sure it feels like it's relatively centered. Just off a little bit. That's good. So then, <clears throat> using a modeling tool or your little end of your paintbrush, Just do that. So you've got a knob. You can just kind of smooth out your fingerprints that you had on there. You can do any. I'm going to stamp a little spiral in the top of these, I think, when they're dry enough. And then if you wanted to throw it, you could even just do that to try and straighten it up. It's going to one side, I guess, a little bit, so I'm going to tilt it. That was the paintbrush that pulled it. There you go. So that's how I make the lid. You know, I could have um, made a strap handle, made a little bird to go on there, but these ones are just gonna be basic teapots without the little bird sculptures that I sometimes do. And if you want to see me do it again, just rewind. I figured that part out of YouTube. You can watch something easily by re-backtracking. Okay, you have a couple of teapots to trim here. Um, and I've shown this in previous videos, but we have so many new subscribers. I've, I'm going to redo this. This whole teapot video has been done before as well. But, um, but I made a couple of lids for teapots a long time ago. And this one was for a little butter keeper, actually. But... Um, I use these on my trimming wheel, um, there's two different ones here, whenever I have a teapot that has a spout um, that will touch the, bit, let me put this down a second, whenever I have a teapot that will, the spout will touch when I turn it upside down, or the handle, in this case the handle and the spout are a little higher than the rim, um, not the bottom of the spout because that has to be lower than here. The, the bottom of the spout has to be lower than here, but the top is a little bit higher and the handle is a little higher too. So I have to, now if you don't have a Giffen grip, you're gonna have to set this up on your trimming wheel um, a little differently, just with lumps of clay that will hold it. Um, but let's see if these are tall enough. I think they're tall enough. So the idea is that it just holds it up a little higher and then your arms on your Giffen grip have to be a little bit higher too so those are just right sometimes i'll hold a little bit higher and we'll see how it goes but um making sure they're all level <coughs> and let's see how centered it is it's still a touch off so i end up just moving it over a touch moving the arm over so it comes this way a touch that's that's much better now and of course i have this thing which i can actually place on the top oh it's just off from the bubble um, so let's see, that would mean it would have to, but it's actually centered, let me just see, yeah it's centered so I'm going to leave it. Um, so that little lid is very useful, throw yourself one, bisque fire it and then you can use it. Um, <clears throat> and you just trim then, as normal. Making sure you don't put too much pressure on. Because well, you know, the arms on this one, of course, I've got a little short. I could raise them up and then it would be much more secure on the Giffen grip. But it's actually pretty secure anyway. 
you can't trim too far down because the handle and the spout, you will hit the handle before you hit the spout. All right, so we're just knocking it down to give yourself a nice gentle curve to the bottom. I make two types of teapots. I make one with a very wide base because some people are a little bit insecure about the very narrow base that I sometimes put on my belly teapots, but that's a, a aesthetic versus function thing again. It's a heavy teapot once you've got water in it, so I can't imagine it gets knocked over that easily anyway. And then I'm just trimming out the center here. Let's give you a little higher look. And I've obviously um, be very careful you don't hit this, you know, your little finger is sticking out over here and you don't want to hook it underneath that handle that's spinning around at high speed because you might break your little finger. So if you've got a giving grip, you've got to be a little careful with those arms that you don't catch yourself. There's a few safety things in the studio I probably should talk about. In the, I never am very careful with anything sharp in a pottery studio. Exacto knives and stuff like that, because I do use exacto blades for removing stencils. If you ever lost one of those, you'd have to throw all your recycled clay away because it probably got swept up in your recycled clay. It's always been a fear, but in 50 years of doing this, I've never lost one, so. But I think, you know, gotta be careful. And then, of course, this thing could break a little finger or something. It, at the very least, it could hit your fingernail and, and give you a, a really bad bruise on your fingernail. Okay, so I've recessed that in a little bit so I can put a little bit of glaze in there, which I don't always do, but my oatmeal glaze is so nice. It's easy to control, it doesn't run. That you could put a thin layer of glaze in there and cover up the clay. Okay, so we got that. See how low the handle is. All the trimmings. Um, and then decide if you want to do something in this lower little area here. I often do a little fluting. But now I have Bill Wright's tools. <clears throat> so I may as well give it a go here. I don't know how thin this is, of course, here. <clears throat> but let's see if I can get a nice little pattern going down there. It starts vibrating immediately. The handle's catching it a little there. What do we have there? Oh, that's a very even pattern. I'm getting better at it. Yeah, that's quite nice. I'll just leave that the way it is, I think. Well, I didn't go over the edge either, so that's kind of nice. Let's see what we have. Then you have to look at the form and see how nice it is as a form. <coughs> see if I can hold it. Not bad. There you go. And I might flute a little bit in the top area here as well, just with a trimming tool when I get it back onto my table area. And this one, the lids are the same size. I always try to throw my teapots with the lid the same size. But the arms are a bit short on this one. This Giffen grip is so old, one of the first ones that they ever came out with. I'm not sure if their newer versions have changed or not. <coughs> I still have my COVID cough. It's got a month over since I got over it, but it still comes back all the time. <coughs> first time I had COVID, that cough lasted months. In the end, I had to get the medication from the doctor to get rid of it. They 
go, perfect again. The wheel that I trim on here is a Shimpo Whisper. I have three of those in my studio. And I don't actually trim out the bottom of these ones. Because they're wide like this, I can fire them on a stilt. They stay, they don't warp. And so I just glaze the bottom and fire it on the stilt. And I can't trim down on this one either because the handle goes right to the bottom. And no texture either, except for I will put something on the top. There you go. That's not a bad teapot either. Nice little teapot. But I want mainly I'm just trying to show you this because this is very handy for trimming teapots. These pieces are now really leather hard, so there's no stickiness at all. And one of the things I like to do is floating, you've seen in many of my pieces. And these pieces, I have to be careful because they're such a wide uh, diameter that the tool sometimes leaves lines in either side. So I've actually sanded off the, the little sharp point on that side <clears throat> so I can usually get away with doing it without leaving that line. You can't do fluting like this if there's any stickiness in the clay at all. Because the tool just sticks to the, you know, it doesn't leave a clean edge. And the, you can actually dent the piece as well. And this is, this clay body is number 516 from Pottery Supply House. I also like to take this little trimming tool, I think it's an R2, is that right? Yeah, R2 by Kemper, and I can do a, an additional narrow fluting line in between the other ones. I actually like the way that looks when the glaze catches it. This is a little easier to get taller as well into the rest of the piece. That'll be nice to catch the, I'm just going to knock off any sharp edge at the bottom there. To catch the variegated blue and oatmeal that I put over the top of Temnicu gold kind of thing in that piece. Alright, that's what I wanted to show you.